Hello and welcome to another episode of Year Round with Yancey, a podcast that explores the lesser known writings of legendary Christian author Philip Yancey, one chapter at a time. I'm your host, the Yancey Yokel. I call myself that because when hosting, I like to keep things simple and not academic or scholarly or all that deep per se. If I did do that, I might call myself the Yancey Scholar or Yancey Professor or something. So I go by Yokel to emphasize the basic simple nature of the podcast. The typical format for the podcast is to consider multiple books at a time, but only one per episode, which means at any given time we'll be looking at at two, maybe three of Yancey's titles in an every other week alternating format, which will keep us from covering the same book in consecutive back-to-back weeks or episodes. I do this in part for the sake of copyright and honoring the work of Mr. Yancey. I realize some may not appreciate this approach, and if that's you, I can only ask for your patience. The books currently in the queue are Yancey's book from 1989, revised in 1998, I Was Just Wondering, and his small book, uh, The Church, Why Bother? Both of these books are seemingly on the lower end of the popularity spectrum, making them, by definition, lesser known, which makes them perfect candidates for this podcast. Because the lower M goal, main goal, of this podcast is to give attention to Yancey's works that you may be largely unfamiliar with. And that leaves the capital M main goal, which is giving attention to to the God Yancey writes about, and of course to his son, Jesus, his spirit, and his word, the ultimate goals of this podcast. The chapters, plural, we're considering this week are uh, chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, I'm sorry, 4, 5, 6, and (laughs) 7, from Yancey's book, I Was Just Wondering. Uh, I do attempt to focus on only a chapter's length portion of a book whenever we have a new episode. And if you've seen this book, you know that the chapters are very brief. And that's in part because every single chapter had a life uh, outside of this book, prior to this book. And that was in the form of short articles Uh, that appeared in Christianity Today between the years 1983 and 1989. So all of these works are previously published, although there's some slight tweaking and revision uh, going on with these chapters, but they're also small. And the last time we looked at this book, we looked at three chapters because I I felt that that was about right for a 30-40 minute episode. I'm squeezing in four this time because I want to finish out part one of this book and part one is called the human animal and so the common thread for all of these chapters is uh, either animals or humans but in when dealing with the human in this part of the book Yancey does some comparing contrasting between uh, us and animals, comparing us to animals, and how are we similar to them, but yet he doesn't want us to forget how different we are. And of course, that seems to be a godly part of what makes us who we are. We are going to be looking at, as I mentioned, uh, four articles. And as we look at each one, I'll remind everyone where the articles first appeared. Do keep in mind, if you want to pick up your own copy of this book, which I strongly encourage, there's a revised edition uh, that's still readily available out there. It was done in 98. Yancey, in his foreword, talks about 
questions. He talks about uh, asking questions, and Yancey is such a thoughtful question asker. He does a good job mulling these uh, questions over without being dogmatic about the answers, which is one thing I think a lot of people appreciate about Yancey. He starts each part of the book with just a list of just head-scratching types of questions, and this part is no exception. There's a page and maybe a third of questions, and some of these questions are addressed in some form or fashion in the chapters that follow. Some aren't so much, although you might think they are. Here's a question or a series that will be addressed with the chapters for today. Why are there dirty jokes? What makes the physiology of excretion and reproduction so funny anyhow? Do gorillas and aardvarks go through midlife crisis? And lastly, why is sex fun? So these are some of the questions that will be uh, touched on in some form or fashion with these four very brief chapter articles. I'll probably refer to them as chapter articles. Hope that's okay. This first chapter article is called in the book, A Theology from Dirty Jokes. It was originally titled, How Dirty Jokes and the Fear of Death Prove There Is a Heaven. It appeared in Christianity Today, March 2nd, 1984. C.S. Lewis gets mentioned a few times in this chapter. In fact, that's one common thread of every paragraph. Uh, C.S. Lewis seems to get a mention in here. And that's because... It's because of one of his statements that uh, Yancey is doing something here with, with dirty jokes. Let me read a line from paragraph one here. Uh, and this is a paraphrase of something Lewis said. Quote, In the absence of any other evidence, the essentials of natural theology could be argued from the human phenomena of dirty jokes and attitudes toward death. Now, I don't know what that quote is from, what C.S. Lewis work that's from. Uh, it's not cited anywhere that I can tell. So Yancey begins with talk about dirty jokes. He claims that a lot of these jokes focus on th these two subjects, excretion and reproduction. Two things he calls two of the most natural processes on earth. That's kind of one of those natural things we share, he says, with all other animals. And yet, it's to us, seemingly, it's not strange to animals, but it's strange to us. So strange that it becomes uh, a part of our, uh, you know, our, our sy system of, of joke telling. <laughs> I guess that's the best way I can think to put it. He also talks about death. And Yancey claims that man, mankind, acts, quote, even less animal like in its presence, the presence of death. Nature treats death as a normal, everyday occurrence. And he goes on to describe how we don't seem to to be in sync with that because we do things like dress up our corpses when there are funerals, we embalm them, we place bodies in airtight caskets uh, or uh, c concrete vaults, um, and he claims this is evidence that, quote, in these rituals we act out a stubborn reluctance to yield to this most powerful of human experiences, end quote. Then he refers to C.S. Lewis again. And he uses a word, uh, disunity here. And this disunity is within us. And here's what he means by that quote, an individual person is a spirit made in the image of God, but merged with a body of mortal flesh. 
Dirty jokes and an obsession with death express a rumbling sense of discord about this in-between state. I love this. Continuing the quote, We should feel dissonance. We are, after all, immortals trapped in mortal surroundings. End quote. And I appreciate that because, you know, uh, for a couple paragraphs, you start almost feeling guilty for feeling, you know, uh, the sense of, uh, I mean, he doesn't use the word awkwardness, I don't believe, but this is the word I was thinking of, awkwardness, when it comes to uh, things like, you know, excretion or maybe even uh, reproduction or certainly death. But then we uh, get this sense of relief it's like oh yancey affirms that hey this is this is normal this is how one would expect us to act because of we're different from animals right we're we we have this godlike part of us this image of god like part and so that mixed with this human animal ish side is just gonna be uh it's it's just gonna be a, a a setting for this this kind of awkwardness, this disunity, dissonance. These are words that are uh, used by Yancey. I like this quote, second to last paragraph of this very short chapter article. According to the biblical view of humanity, it is natural that we blush at excretion and draw back from death. Such actions seem odd because they are odd. In all of earth, there are no exact parallels of spirit and immortality housed in matter, end quote. And I don't think there's a better chapter article in this section that's devoted to the human animal, because uh, even though uh, this, this chapter is very brief, not a lot of meat to sink your teeth into per se it's it's right in the middle of the the, the part you know the chapter or, i'm sorry the section human animal three chapter articles before three chapter articles after it's right in the middle i don't know if that was deliberate or not but it's just the perfect human animal uh glimpse it's just a glimpse it's so quick uh but this 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 weird aspect of our nature you know we we we, we don't treat reproduction, excretion, death like animals. It's because that's only a part of us. We're so unanimal-like at the same time. Just uh, something to, to, to mull over. Like I said, in, in keeping with these questions Yancey likes to ask, just just, just think about it, you know? Let, let's just mull, mull over it for a few minutes and move on. Let's move on to the next chapter article. It's called High School Reunion in the book, it was originally titled The Human Animal at a High School Reunion. It appeared in Christianity Today, November 7th, 1986. Uh, I want to read the first sentence or two and then ask, well, just share with you the question I first thought of when I read these uh, lines. Quote, if I were a diehard evolutionist seeking to discredit the Christian doctrine of man, I think I would spend my time not digging for bones in Dr. Leakey's Africa, but rather roaming the halls of America's high schools, end quote. Just want to stop there. I just couldn't help but ask questions uh, like, wh where is Yancey going with this? Uh, how so? How would hanging out at a high school, uh, knowing he was going to be dealing maybe with a high school reunion, what what might Yancey mean by that statement? And then he uses in the next sentence a word I was not familiar with. I had to look it up. You know, um, I'm going to read the sentence and then share with you the definition in case you're like me and aren't familiar with it. The, the sentence reads as follows. They, these American high schools, that's what he's talking about. They offer science a showcase for the human animal at its most 
atavistic. That's A T A V I S T I C. Atavistic. According to Webster's, atavism is a recurrence in an organism of a trait or character typical of an ancestral form. Ancestral, I think, is a key term there. Ancestral form, and usually due to genetic recombination. <laughs> it's one of those definitions I feel like I need even further unpacking. Um, atavism derives via French from Latin atavus, meaning ancestor. Anyway, for what it's worth. He goes on to talk about uh, some of the typical, you know, stereotypical categories of groups, uh, tribes, so to speak, in a high school setting like jocks. He talks about jocks. He talks about cheerleader types. He talks about nerds. He talks about hoods, or that's what he called them back when, I guess, when he was young, greasers. Um, and he uh, is, is obviously, he's making these references to what these types would look like at a high school reunion, you know, 20 years later. You know, the jocks still look like jocks in many respects. Cheerleaders still, still look like, you know, beauty queens for the most part. Nerds have put everybody to shame with their 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 jobs. You know, they've excelled in uh, things like science, perhaps, computer programming, etc. Um, uh, and Hoods, I forget what he says about them, except like the others, they, they haven't changed all that much. Anyway, he does, uh, in this first little section of the chapter article, mentioning a, an incident that happened when he was in high school. Uh, it was a fight, a major fight, uh, that broke out between a jock, a high school quarterback, and one of the hoods or greaser types. And it was a fight over a girl. And he was using that example to highlight how, you know... Uh, animal-like that kind of behavior is. You know, there's two guys trying to beat each other up for the sake of a woman. Um, you know, we, we see signs of that in the animal world, do we not? And he uses that as a springboard to talk about how a behaviorist might uh, consider that uh, behavior being very animalistic. But... Yancey doesn't stay there. He has a, a, a quote he shares from uh, G.K. Chesterton and then Dostoevsky. But uh, before he gets to th those quotes, he makes this statement, but there is another side to the human animal. And aren't we glad there is? <laughs> you know, something that the behaviorist uh, couldn't, you know, chalk up to animal uh, behavior. And so uh, I think to get at what Yancey's uh, getting at, I need to read a few quotes here, uh, including this one, Reflection on uh, a quote from Dostoevsky. Yancey writes, he was Dostoevsky, was expressing the most basic fact of Christian anthropology, that the human animal was created to be more than animal. He talks about how we have the ability to transcend biological destiny and prove that we are more than animals. Um, he does go back to an earlier sentiment in the chapter by uh, commenting that, you know, how we... We have a, this drive within us towards self-preservation, survival of the fittest. Uh, we compete, like the animals, on the basis of power and physical appearance. Um, and we place a lot of emphasis on our impressive physiques, which could be viewed as very animalistic. But, there's a big but here again, and the rest of the chapter article uh, is more in keeping with this but here. Uh, 
But our Christian calling, Yancey writes, asks us to defy those instincts. And then here's a the first reference to Jesus here in the chapter. Jesus announced, quote, a great reversal of values in his Sermon on the Mount, elevating not the rich or attractive, but rather the poor, the persecuted, and those who mourn. Instead of lauding such traits as wealth, political power, and physical beauty, he warned against their dangers. A passage like Luke 18 shows the kind of people who impressed Jesus. An oppressed widow, a despairing tax collector, a small child, a blind beggar. One more line to read here. Instinctually, animals mark the weak. Yancey writes in parentheses, question mark, the nerds? For quick destruction, we are commanded to value them. I don't have anything to add to that. I do want to read another few lines at the very end of this chapter article, uh, which builds on that, and then we'll move on to our next chapter article. Yancey writes, quote, Our failure, failure to convince many scientists of the uniqueness of humankind made in the image of God makes me wonder about trying a different tack entirely. What if, instead of trying to prove that Homo sapiens is not an animal, we sought to prove that we are far more Instead of challenging the antiquity of fossils or disputing the results of genetic engineering, we could simply demonstrate that biology is not destiny. I love that. He goes on to mention the fruit of the Spirit and how they don't give, in society, in human society, they don't give awards, especially in high school, for the... the the, the fruit of the Spirit, like the most patient, the most kind, good, faithful, etc. But that is what we aspire to, is it not? Especially those of us who follow after God. Yancey ends this chapter with this line, I love it, and perhaps, just perhaps, exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit may be our very best defense against a materialist view of mankind here on earth, end quote. The next chapter, the second to last in this first part, is called in the book, The New Determinism. And you wouldn't know from that, that title that this chapter has a lot to do with midlife crises. But the original title in Christianity Today from September 1983 definitely did. It was called, Is the Midlife Crisis a Phony? And like I said, the title of the book chapter is The New Determinism. Determinism, I had to look this up, so I hope you don't mind me admitting that and sharing with you that the definition of determinism, if you're not familiar with it, is simply the doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes external to the will. Okay, now that will be expounded on a bit in the chapter article, in case you're still scratching your head about it. He starts this section with a, a few paragraphs talking about uh, mid, a midlife crisis. Not that he was going through as much as crises he saw a lot of his friends going through. I guess he wrote this probably at a time when he was entering that phase of life, and maybe a lot of his friends were uh, entering that phase too, and they were taking different paths during this phase than Yancey was, seemingly, um, especially when it came to their marriages. And uh, he seemed to have a few friends who were either contemplating or just flat out leaving their wives. Uh, in this midlife crisis, uh, including crisis of faith, it seems like. And he, uh, Yancey mentions some, some sentiments that he's heard some of these friends uh, share, like, 
Uh, I have changed. I'm a different man today than when I married her. I must be true to myself and follow who I really am as far as that leads me. I can see why I used to love her, but I am now bound to follow my new dreams and expectations, which she simply can't fulfill. And so when it all comes down to it, midlife crisis through this lens simply is a, a rationalized adultery some sort infidelity divorce and and so this is what the rationalizing sounds like basically and Yancey seems to make the point that these may be authentic feelings maybe they aren't making them up per se the question is where are they coming from um, and why might these uh, believers, these Christian men, uh, why might they be following these voices in their uh, heads instead of pushing against them and following the voice uh, of God? And he does mention that uh, people seem to act like there's a force bigger than they can resist at work in this. And, you know, Yancey is honest about this, uh, and I, I believe it's true, uh, but uh, there, there's just there are just so many factors built into the, these forces that are being described, including good old-fashioned, I would say animalistic, even lust, um, because, you know, uh, as, as we all know, that's just a part of our nature, uh, like it or not. Yancey mentions two trends that he is uh, puzzled, baffled about uh, in some of this sentiment. Uh, and the first one he describes this way, quote, My friends spend so much time looking inward, examining themselves in order to ascertain what will make them fulfilled, self-actualized, and happy. He asked the question, does this not seem odd? A self, the observer, scrutinizes a self, the observed, which also happens to be the same self. How can I observe myself to find out what I really want if I, the observer, am the very one who is wanting it? I just had to underline that, put exclamations in the margin and a big smiley face there, because if you stop and think about it. It is truly ridiculous. Um, he mentions um, all sorts of great questions here. He asks, can a person who is actively lusting objectively examine himself and decide the future direction of his life without being affected by the lust itself? He says, that seems to me like asking an alcoholic to rationally assess his need for alcohol at a New Year's Eve party. End quote. Sounds interesting. He mentions a verse from Jeremiah 17, 9, and here's the quote concerning it. Uh, wonderful wisdom straight from Scripture. He says, The Bible challenges us to look upward, not inward, for counsel at moments of crisis. As Jeremiah says, quote, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? End quote. And that is from Jeremiah 17, 9. If you'd like to look it up, pray over it, contemplate it. Some of us may need to hear that verse right now. Why? Because it's so easy to listen to our heart, to, to do what Yancey is, is trying to critique here, looking inward and kind of following our heart, which is kind of what, you know, maybe the average uh, romance novel encourages, romantic movie encourages, etc., etc. That's what people do. It's just the norm, it seems, in our, our world. But how dangerous that is to just look in inward at our heart and just kind of let it call the shots, which is what uh, seems like people... Uh, 
uh, to, to Yancey's point, a, a high percentage maybe in this midlife uh, phase of life are, uh, are falling uh, prey to. The second trend, he says, uh, he's baffled by uh, is this, quote, once the observing self learns what will make him happy, fulfilled and actualized, a kind of determinism switches on. The husband feels bound, now that's a key term here, bound to follow the inner voice, assuring him that Miss B, capital B, is the solution to his life, not time-worn Mrs. A, that's capital A. He says this determinism is a force of the highest order and often proves more powerful than paternal instincts and marriage vows to state and God. End quote. He then goes on to provide a quote from Dorothy Sayers from uh, a book he describes as an obscure book written during World War II called A Begin Here. I have to be honest and say I didn't, I had trouble connecting her quote with what Yancey was talking about. So I'm going to skip it and read what Yancey says about her quote. If that's okay. Here's Yancey's quote. Sayers goes on to describe the difference between murdering one's mother-in-law and writing a detective story about such a murder. Both acts may spring from the same unconscious impulse, she says, so that each activity begins with the same raw material. But the difference lies precisely in how the unconscious impulse is acted upon. And this is Yancey's way of saying, you know, just because you feel this and your heart is leading you this way, there, there's more than one way to deal with that. There's more than one way to respond to that. Uh, and I guess I, I feel like Yancey's trying to empower the readers to know that, hey, just because you feel that this is the only path, it is not, and you do not have to take it, even though you're feeling compelled to in a deterministic way. He ends this chapter article this way. He says, maybe it's time for an equally strong emphasis on the human freedom that allows us sometimes to go against that subconscious for the sake of fidelity. Of course, a key term there is fidelity. We can do it, you guys. We can do it. We can be faithful uh, even when our heart is leading us uh, in another direction. And it, why? Because there's that freedom we enjoy. Isn't that a wonderful part of being human? That we have the freedom to make those decisions, those faithful decisions. Let's move on to the last chapter article from this part, The Human Animal. Let's remember, this is the thread here. The Human Animal thread holds all these chapter articles together. The title of this chapter article is The Problem of Pleasure. And that was the original title of the article that appeared uh, originally in June 1988 uh, in Christianity Today. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned this the last time we looked at this book, but I think one of the reasons I'm enjoying it so much is because, if I'm not mistaken, this is the way I discovered Yancey uh, earlier on. I, I, didn't, I hadn't read some of his big-time books, you know, Jesus I Never Knew, uh, What's So Amazing About Grace, and all of that, even though they were around when I first discovered Yancey. I remember discovering him in my work in a library. It's a theological library. I had Christianity Today, full runs of it to, to browse through, and I did. And I remember uh, discovering some of these older articles of Yancey's and just digging and digging, trying to find more and more of them. And so some so many of these articles are just coming back to me. Uh, because when I discovered uh, them, uh, th it was in the mid-90s or so. So this was uh, years after they were first written. And uh, so glad that these were reproduced to make them more accessible to people these days. But anyway, uh, 
the title again is The Problem of Pleasure. So that immediately evokes a question. What problem? What's the problem? I didn't think there was a problem with pleasure. At least I never thought about it before. So what is the problem? And so here's how Yancey explains it. He asks three questions. Rapid fire fashion at the beginning of this chapter article. Why is sex fun? And the assumption is that it does in that question is it doesn't have to be fun, does it? I mean, just to, to procreate, to have kids, does it have to be fun? And yet it is. Uh, why is eating fun? Why are there colors? You know, and again, the assumption uh, there doesn't have to be colors, really. We could live in a world of black and white or just white or just black, or whatever. But we have all these colors. These are questions Yancey throws out, all in the uh, realm of pleasure, right? Sex, pleasurable. Eating, pleasurable. We enjoy colors, pleasurable. Listen to this. Yancey writes, quote, It struck me the other day after I had read my umpteenth book on the problem of pain, the theological obsession of this century, it seems, that I have never even seen a book on the problem of pleasure. Nor have I met a philosopher who goes around shaking his head in perplexity over the basic question of why we experience pleasure. I've got to read these next lines. Sorry for the extended quote. Where did pleasure come from? That seems to me a huge question. The philosophical equivalent for atheists to the problem of pain for Christians. On the issue of pleasure, Christians can breathe a little easier. A good and loving God would naturally want his creatures to experience delight, joy, and personal fulfillment. We Christians start from the assumption and then from that assumption and then look for ways to explain the origin of suffering. But don't atheists and secular humanists have an equal obligation to explain the origin of pleasure in a world of randomness and meaninglessness? Question mark? End quote. Don't you love the way Yancey states that? And you know, maybe there are other people asking questions like this. Uh, I just remember when I, especially when I first read this years ago, I hadn't thought about it. I, uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm guilty of not either uh, considering it or reading people who are considering that question. But uh, yeah, isn't it? Uh, uh, thought-provoking, isn't it? Uh, in encouraging, even for those of us who have no doubts about the existence of God and being created by Him in a very special way, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just kind of one of those extra things uh, that we that is staring at us in the face. You know, every time we eat a hamburger, and we're loving it. Why does it have to be so pleasurable? I mean, things like that and. Uh, and as Yancey mentions, you know, maybe the atheists aren't the ones that have the problem, uh, uh, aren't, aren't deal grappling with questions like, uh, why is the, there pain in the world? Um, that's something that people of faith seem to be grappling with because it just doesn't add up with this loving God who could do anything, et cetera, et cetera. But what about the pleasure part? Why, why aren't people uh, like atheists who claim that, you know, after the Big Bang, everything just sort of fell into place in a sort of random, very, uh, very lucky way, but I mean, still random, and yet we have all this pleasure surrounding us. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Uh, there's a, another quote or two from uh, G.K. Chesterton here, specifically his book, uh, from his book, Orthodoxy. Uh, Yancey writes, G.K. Chesterton traced his own Christian conversion to the problem of pleasure. I didn't know about that till I read this. I think that's interesting. I've never read Orthodoxy. He says, uh, Chesterton found, quote, materialism too thin to account for the sense of wonder and delight that sometimes marks our response to the world and especially to such simple human acts as sex and childbirth and artistic creation. 
then there's an extended quote from Chesterton's work. Uh, again, I'd like to skip the quote and share a quote from Yancey in response to that quote. Yancey writes, In a single sweep, Chesterton has helped clarify the problem of pleasure. For the unbeliever, the problem centers in the question of origin. Where did pleasure come from? Chesterton searched all alternatives and settled on Christianity as the only reasonable explanation for the existence of pleasure in the world. Love that quote. He ends the chapter by referring to, uh, st I, I should say, he starts the end of the chapter by referring to Ecclesiastes. I love this. He says, it occurs to me that perhaps I have read a book on the problem of pleasure, the biblical book of Ecclesiastes. That story of decadence by the richest, wisest, and most talented person in the world serves as a perfect allegory for what can happen when we lose sight of the giver whose good gifts we enjoy. Now, I like how uh, Yancey transitions a, a bit and, and deals with kind of a, a different aspect of the problem of pleasure. When we over-focus on it, we seek it out too much, um, going past what God seems to have envisioned for us. And yet I felt like it was a little off topic. You know, um, it, it's interesting, but it could have warranted a, a its own chapter article in a way. Uh, here's what I mean. He says, thus ple pleasure is at once a great good and a grave danger. If we start chasing pleasure as an end in itself, along the way we may lose sight of the one who gave us such good gifts as sexual drive, taste buds, and the capacity to appreciate beauty. Now, one thing I do appreciate about this is um, Yancey wants our focus to be Godward. He wants our focus at every turn to, to be uh, heavenward, uh, focused on the God who, who is worthy of praise for the, for the, for the careful way he has crafted us, which does involve, of course, the pleasure aspect as well. Let's end with this quote, second to last paragraph from this chapter article and this whole first part. Quote, somehow Christians have gotten a reputation as anti-pleasure, and this despite the fact that they believe pleasure was an invention of the Creator himself. We Christians have a choice. We can present ourselves as uptight bores who sacrificially forfeit half the fun of life by limiting our indulgence in sex, food, and other sensual pleasures. Or we can set about enjoying pleasure to the fullest, which means enjoying it in the way the Creator, capital C, intended. End quote. I love that. That's just the perfect summation of the two sides of the pleasure coin Yancey deals with in this chapter. And that brings us to the end of part one of this wonderful book filled with so many great questions and just some considerations of possible uh, answers. And we'll return, Lord willing, to this book in a couple of episodes. Uh, the plan is to look at the Church, Why Bother Again, Chapter 2, from that very short book. Remember, it only has three chapters, so we'll be through with it uh, very soon. Don't forget that there's a new, brand new book out uh, this month, October 2021. Uh, Gansey's latest, it's his memoir, Where the Light Fell, a memoir is what it's called. A 320-page book published by Convergent Books. I have had my copy for a week and a half now, about through the first tenth of the book. And the best way I can describe it is, if you've heard Yancey talk, and you've heard his personal story, his testimony, so to speak, well, not his faith journey as much as just his, his well, yeah, his faith journey, but that early part when he was young, and maybe some of the events from his youth that led to his turning away from uh, faith uh, a little bit later in life before returning to it 
But uh, this is just a an ultra detailed extended version of probably anything you've heard him say about that. And so if you are interested uh, in anything you've heard him talk about before uh, regarding this, this early stage of his life, you'll love this book. Uh, Yancey just has a knack. I don't know if he just did a wonderful job journaling better than the average person when he was young, but his, his sense of detail and recollection from when he was young is just, uh, I mean, it, it, it is mind boggling to me who, uh, just personally, I can't remember just seemingly three fourths of my childhood when it comes to, uh, everyday events and details, but Yancey seems to be able to, uh, at least he's convincing me he, he, he remembers them well, and just a great read. Please consider picking up a copy of that, and please consider picking up a copy of the 1998 revised edition of I Was Just Wondering, the book we've been considering in this episode. As always, I'd like to encourage you, if you like this podcast, want to support me and the podcast in any way, don't support me directly. Instead, turn your attention to a wonderful group that deserves your support, I, I believe. It's called, uh, the group is called Books for Africa. You can find them online at booksforafrica.org. If you like what you see there and want to support their mission, uh, help support their mission to end the book famine in Africa, uh, you can make a donation there. And then, if you don't mind sharing with me the fact that you did that, in part because you learned about them from this podcast, it would just make my day. It'll be a, a huge uh, uplift and encouragement to me. You can let me know at yearroundwithyancey at gmail.com. That's an email you can use to send me questions uh, or comments, both good, bad, uh, indifferent. I'm okay with all of it. Uh, just look forward to hearing from you. want to thank you again for joining me for this episode of Year Round with Yancey. I look forward to our next visit very soon. God bless.